Good evening, and welcome to this evening's virtual book club gathering. I'm Jane O. Newman, Professor of Comparative Literature at the University of California, Irvine. I'm a trustee of the National Humanities Center, and I'm going to be your host for this evening's event. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that we'd really love to have you pose questions uh, this evening. So to participate in that discussion, though, you'll need to log into YouTube using your Gmail account. Just click on the uh, blue sign in button in the, uh, in the right up corner and follow the prompt. If you don't have a Gmail account, <coughs> you can either cr easily create one for free by following the instructions on that sign in page. Now, let's just turn to this evening's discussion. Over the past two months, millions of prote protesters outraged by extrajudicial homicides and police violence have taken to the streets insisting that significant steps are needed to address the many forms of anti-Black racism that have plagued our country for generations. Our guest this evening is Brenda Stevenson, Nickel Family Endowed Chair in History and Professor in African American Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Since she first emerged from Yale's PhD program, Brenda's work has helped reshape our understanding around questions of gender, uh, race, family, and social conflict in America and the Atlantic world from as far back as the colonial period up through the late 20th century. Her award-winning book, Life in Black and White, Family and Community in the Slave South, revealed important truths about the family structures of enslaved people and challenged the notion that most enslaved people lived in nuclear families with a male head. For this and her subsequent scholarly work, Brenda has been honored with innumerable awards and her work has been supported with fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the American Academy in Berlin, the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, and the National Humanities Center, among others. This evening, Brenda has kindly agreed to talk with us about her book, The Contested Murder of Latasha Harlins, Justice, Gender, and the Origins of the LA Riots, which recontextualizes the 1992 Los Angeles uprising that followed in the wake of the Rodney King trial and challenges many widely held notions about US race relations and racial conflict. Contested Murder was awarded the Organization of American Historians 2014 James A. Raleigh Prize for the best book on the history of race relations in the US. And the Women's E! News honored Brenda with the 2015 Ida B. Wells Award for bravery in journalism for this book as well. So please join me then in welcoming Professor Brenda Stevenson tonight. Well, um, good afternoon, good evening to all of you all, and thank you for joining me this evening. It is indeed an honor to be back at the National Humanities Center, uh, where I first, first met Jane. Uh, nice to see you again, Jane. Um, and I am really pleased to have this opportunity to address those persons, um, you, the audience, who clearly appreciate the efforts of um, the Humanities Center. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about my book, Life, um, The Contested Murder of Latasha Harlins. And I'm going to do so by sharing with you a PowerPoint presentation as I talk. So if you could just hold on, um, I will share my screen with you. Let me get that. Right. Okay, so um, what you see here is a title of the book, of course, and three um, individuals. Um, Latasha Harlins is the black, is the African American girl um, to you all's left. Um, just Judge Joyce Carlin is in the center, and Soon Ja Du is over to the right. Now, the book really talks about the interactions of these three females with one another in 1991. In 1990 and in 1991, um, as we move forward to look at some of the reasons behind um, the unrest, the LA riots of 1992. I have to say that when um, this case occurred, I had just moved to Los Angeles. And so I was very interested in, in everything in Los Angeles. I had lived my entire life either in the American South because I'm originally from Virginia and went to college at the University of Virginia. And then I, um, I went to the Northeast, but I had been working at the University of Texas at Austin before I arrived um, in Los Angeles. And so Los Angeles for me was a, a, a different place. I had grown up hearing about, you know, laid back Los Angeles. Los Angeles was, you know, sort of touted as the most diverse city in the country and a city where you wouldn't find a lot of, you know, racial conflict, although of course you had the, had the 
Watts riots of 1965, pause on that. But it also did have Tom Bradley, who was the mayor, who was, when I arrived, going into his fifth, I mean, he was in his, his fifth um, um, term as mayor of Los Angeles. And so Los Angeles proposed to those people who were visiting, particularly a person like me, uh, who focuses on race uh, and racial conflict as this kind of different space than certainly the American South. Um, well, I had not been there and I'm trying to move my, okay, let me just move this along. I had not been there very long. In fact, I had arrived in that January and this case took place um, in that March. Right before that, um, of course, had been the Rodney King beating about two weeks before the Latasha Hollins murder. And I thought, okay, what's happened here? You know, what is happening here? First, we have you know, Rodney King, and then we have Latasha Harless. The image that you see before you now is one that I found very inspirational in, in doing the work. Look what you created. Uh, and this is part of the Pulitzer Prize winning photography that went into um, documenting um, the LA um, insurrection or riots or rebellion of 1992. Oftentimes people ask whether or not this was really a revolt. Um, I think that, you know, there this is one indication that people were thinking beyond the looting, that they actually were thinking um, also about the, uh, the political um, background of this particular case. But we're going to get back to that. I don't want to get stalled on that right now. So what happened was on March 16th, um, 1991, Latasha Harlins went into the Empire Liquor Market, um, which was located in South Figaro in South Los Angeles. She lived in that community. Um, it was a community um, that was uh, working class. It was a community at the time that was predominantly African-American, but moving very rapidly to being um, predominantly Latinx. Um, she was uh, a freshman in high school um, at the time. She went in to purchase um, some orange juice. And um, in about 15 minutes or so after she walked into the store, she was dead. Um, so what happened in the interim? And these images that you see uh, are just suggestive of what this conflict um, ostensibly or superficially was about. Um, she came into contact with Soon Ja Du, and Soon Ja Du uh, was a storekeeper's wife. She was working behind the counter um, that morning. She thought that Latasha Hollins was stealing from her. Why? She thought Latasha was stealing because she had taken the orange juice out of the refrigerated cases and she had placed it in her backpack. Now, um, purportedly unknown by Mrs. Du was that Latasha had the $2 to purchase the orange juice in her hand. The police found it crumbled up in her hand when they came in and found um, her body. But um, in her interactions with Latasha, there was a heated argument that took place. She grabbed Latasha um, by her jacket and pulled her across the counter, trying to actually reach her backpack um, to get the orange juice out of it and accusing her of stealing the orange juice. Now, um, Latasha was a streetwise um, young lady um, and, you know, if you know young people 15 years old or whatever, you really don't touch them. I mean, you certainly don't grab them. So what happened uh, was that there was a fight that took place. Latasha knocked down Mrs. Du um, a couple of times, three times actually. And as and Latasha decided to, you know, it wasn't worth it. Um, she, the orange juice in the meanwhile had fallen to the ground and, um, and she bent down, picked it up, put it on the counter, turned to walk away. Uh, Mrs. Du However, um, in her testimony saying fear for her life, she had picked up a gun from behind the counter. As, Lato as Latasha turns um, to walk away, she's shot in the back of the head. Okay. Um, and so again, as I said, this happens about two weeks and this is just a clip from um, the documentary. You see ABC News, uh, the documentary or the documentary evidence with regard to the beating of uh, Rodney King. It happened about two weeks after the beating of Rodney King. And this is gonna be really important for uh, my development of the, of the book because 
as you now know, many people, when they think about 1992, they really call it the Rodney King riots. You know, Rodney King is labeled all the time with regard to this, and for good reason, because this is the case that the jury was deciding on right before um, the riots began at the at the end of April uh, 1992. But what a lot of people don't understand is that the Latasha Harlins case always was in the shadow of, or overshadowing even, in terms of the black community, what was going on. Um, um, in the sense of whether or not justice could be had for African Americans in Los Angeles. All right, so um, there was this sense that, as I said, in a lingering one as well, that this uh, insurrection or the riot that took place in 1992 really was about Rodney King. And in large measure it was, but it also was about Latasha Harmons. And that's really what the book explores. What was happening with regard to this particular case that in some ways was tremendously different from that of Rodney King, but also um, uh, was similar in some ways too, or sort of worked into this broad sense of inequality um, in the court system for Black people um, in Los Angeles. And this is a photograph of uh, of Latasha, as you can see in a photograph of Rodney King when he's making his famous speech with regard to, can't we all just get along? Right, so uh, look, just to be very clear, what were people protesting with regard to Latasha Hamas? Well, Mrs. Dew did go to trial. Okay, uh, what's very interesting is that initially she was charged with first degree murder and special circumstances, which was a death penalty case. All right. By the time that it got to the courts, it had the judge in the case um, had removed um, that particular charge and decided that it would we, they would look at um, either voluntary mass, second degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, or involuntary manslaughter. Um, she was found guilty um, of uh, voluntary manslaughter with the use and the use of a, uh, of a firearm. And the probation officer in the case um, had decided or had recommended to the court that Mrs. Dew receive the maximum sentence, which was 16 years in prison. Um, and so, uh, but what happens is that um, Judge Carlin decides that Mrs. Dew should receive no jail time past when she was first arrested before she got out on bail, that she should pay Latasha's funeral expenses and that she should receive 300 hours of community service and five years probation, okay? So I want you all to keep this, um, you know, this, judgment, the sentencing of Mrs. Stu in mind as we go through. I'm going to work back um, to look at the beginning of the case to get to this. So no jail time, uh, payment of Latasha's funeral expenses, 300 hours of community service, and five years probation for someone who's been found guilty of voluntary uh, manslaughter. It was the lightest sentence uh, for voluntary manslaughter in um, California that year. Uh, which was 1991, uh, okay. So uh, this just, again, some images of the insurrection that took place um, afterwards. Um, Los Angeles, 1992 was the most um, um, violent of responses with regard to race riots. Um, 54 people died, a um, billion dollars worth of uh, a damage, a billion dollars worth of damage um, in 1992 dollars, which is of course much more um, today. Um, and Koreatown is practically destroyed um, as a result of it. Now, the destruction of Koreatown is really what got, also got, what got me to thinking about how does Latasha Holland's case, um, how is it related to this particular um, so event of social unrest? It was, after all, this Korean shopkeeper and that particular case with regard to Latasha Harlins that um, in really instilled within the, the community that if, um, if, if there should be destruction 
um, shopkeepers, Korean shopkeepers, shops and properties should be destroyed um, as a way of atoning for um, the death of Latasha Harlins. All right, so again, uh, one of the responses, um, so a revolution is a solution. Um, I, I, again, I want to remind you all of what may be some of the political underpinnings of this kind of uh, reaction to legal cases as we see, of course, in our society today also associated with uh, what happened in 1992, okay? So um, another thing that really interests me about the case is that um, this was a case really about women, okay? This was a case really about females. There were three major females, actually four, but I focused on three. The judge, George Collin, who was born in 1951, she graduated from Loyola Law School, joined the U.S. Attorney's Office, was very successful in the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, and also um, she was appointed in 1991 by Judge uh, by Governor uh, Wilson, who was a Republican um, governor in the state of California at the time. Um, she also was married to a lawyer who became a judge too, and they were very high-ranking in the state Republican Party. Um, this is, uh, you know, uh, one of her pictures from high school. One of the cool things about doing this book was I got to use um, Ancestry.com for the first time uh, really extensively, and it, they had such interesting information like, you know, high school photographs, for example, and she's located um, in the first row over to, if you're looking at your community uh, at the right with the, um, the dark haired petite woman um, who's there. Um, that's her. Um, the second major person or maybe one of the, the second key person um, in this case is Sun Jadu. Um, Sun Jadu, who was uh, a nationalized um, Korean um, uh, American um, living in the United States at the time, born in 1941 um, with a literature degree from a university in Seoul, Korea, married to um, a person who owned a, who owned a business um, in Seoul, Korea, who had been a major in the, in the military in Korea as well. They had decided to migrate or immigrate to the United States in 1976. Um, it's a huge decade for um, Korean um, migration to the United States in which Los Angeles became um, the most, uh, the, the site of most Koreans outside of actually North Korea and South Korea. Okay, uh, a lot of the people who migrated became shopkeepers so for various reasons, it's difficult to get into your professions because of language difficulties, prejudices against um, people, etc. So many people in the Korean community in um, South Los um, Southern California became shopkeepers. Indeed, if you looked at South Los Angeles um, at the time of the killing of Lat Latasha Harlins, 60% of the liquor stores cleaners, nail shops, et cetera, were owned by Korean Americans. So they really had um, a great presence in terms of the businesses of uh, that community. Right. And then we have Latasha Harlems, the girl who's killed. She had been born in 1976 in East St. Louis. Um, she um, had moved with her family in 1981, um, five years um, after Soon Jadu um, arrived. And um, she had 1986, she had the tragic loss of her mother who was killed killed. And uh, in 1990, she was a freshman in high school. Uh, and so on March 16, 1991, Latasha was shot at the Empire uh, Liquor Market. All right, so uh, some of the things about her, um, although she wasn't doing particularly well in her freshman, the transition from middle school to high school, um, she had been on the honor roll, and you can see the arrow pointing to her picture um, when she was in um, um, middle school. And 
also this picture here um, in the sixth grade honor roll as well. She really um, had um, ambitions for becoming a lawyer. And the interesting thing about it is that um, one of the, of the things that happens is that she wants to become a lawyer because when her mother had been killed um, five years prior, uh, when her mother was killed, her the person who killed her only received two years um, in terms of a prison sentence, also for voluntary uh, manslaughter. And she had thought that, and her entire family, this is her aunt, this other picture beside her is not a picture of her mother, um, but her aunt uh, who led the protest um, against the sentencing, she really thought that this was unfair. And so she wanted to become an attorney so that she could um, bring better um, justice to the African-American, particularly the poor um, African-American community. Um, before I get to this image, I just want to backtrack a little bit and talk about this relationship between Korean Americans and African Americans at the time. It had it was a tense relationship in urban areas where Korean Americans and African Americans were living, and also um, where Korean Americans had a particular um, impact on the local economies or the localized economies um, in. Um, South Los Angeles, there had been a lot of um, conflict between shopkeepers and African American customers. So just to set the stage, um, this conflict really began um, in the mid-1970s when Korean um, immigrants began to um, arrive in large numbers and to purchase shops in um, those areas where they were affordable, um, which tended to be working class um, African American and Latinx um, communities. The conflicts really began, however, in the high schools and um, and there were, you know, kind of notorious fights that took place between Korean immigrant um, children and African American children and Latinx children. It spread out to the business districts um, fairly soon. Um, there was a big strike that had been her, uh, had, for example, at the Korean swap meet in South Los Angeles. Um, Latasha's uncle actually had worked for the dues for a while, um, but had quit his job because he had because he testified the dues did not want to pay him uh, well. They were very racist against, or they acted in a discriminatory manner um, towards the black customers who came in. On the side of the dues, what they argued was that they really feared for their lives because a number of Korean shopkeepers had been killed by um, African-American and Latinx customers because um, it, they were located in a place in South Los Angeles where gangs, if you remember, anyone remember the 1980s um, gang violence was very big in Los Angeles at the time, and they had been impacted by uh, their, uh, by that. Um, also, there had been a lot of shop keep, um, shoplifting in their store and um, retaliation uh, when they complained about it. They said, you know, they were threatened um, in their, uh, their lives were threatened, um, et cetera. So there was a lot of tension that was going on around the Empire liquor market at the time that Latasha was killed. In fact, um, her guardian at the time, who was her grandmother, had asked her not to go into the store because there was, she said, there was always something going on between the dues um, and their customers. It's an early Saturday morning, 15 year old Latasha decides to go and buy the orange juice. At, um, at any rate, and, um, and she um, ends up dead as a result of it. The response to it uh, of her killing was immediate in the African-American community. By this happened on a Saturday, um, by Monday afternoon, there was a boycott of the store, there was a boycott of um, other stores um, in the area. Uh, so this, case got immediate attention. Like the Rodney King case, it also, there was a videotape of the confrontation between Mrs. Du and Latasha. And um, this confrontation um, showed, although it didn't have any um, verbal, 
you couldn't hear the vocal of it. You could just see it, but you could see the fight that took place between them. And you could see uh, Mrs. Du holding uh, the gun and shooting um, um, Latasha. There was some, and it, this was brought up in the court case, there was some uh, question as to whether or not um, the gun, the trigger of the gun was a hairpin trigger. That is, Mrs. Du would not have had to do very much for the gun um, to go off. And there was evidence brought um, by a gun expert that it did have a very altered trigger. And um, it wasn't sure whether or not it had been altered by the dues or the gun had been stolen at some point and then returned by the police or had been altered when it was um, returned, before it was returned to them. But nonetheless, um, it would go off without having to press down on the trigger um, very extensively. Um, in the summer that led up to the trial for Latasha Harlins, um, it, uh, was linked with the Rodney King case. And often on national news, you would see the videotapes of the two um, together. So it became very much linked with this case, not only um, in the black community, but also um, nationally um, in terms of the local media. What the Du family said about um, the way in which the African-American community had responded to it, um, basically, was that they were being scapegoated by the police because the police were embarrassed by the Rodney King beating, and they wanted to show that they were not discriminatory with regard to black, the loss of black life or black life and the, the, the um, value of black life. So that's why she had been charged with first degree murder versus second degree or um, involuntary or voluntary manslaughter, that they were out to scapegoat Mrs. Du, um, et cetera. So um, the summer goes on. There's a lot of tension between the Black community and Korean shopkeepers. Um, a number of people are shot. Some people are killed on both sides. There's a many sort of war that's going on um, in South Los Angeles between African Americans and Korean Korean Americans um, at the time. So that when we actually see the sentence, um, her being found guilty, of voluntary manslaughter. And then the judge seemingly um, placing the sentence um, to the side and coming up with a sentence that seemed unusually and insultingly light to the African-American community. There is a lot of outcry within the community. The case does go up. Um, it is appealed to the California um, Appeals Court. And what the judges find is that um, they find that uh, while there were some inaccuracies um, that the judge had um, performed and, and she hadn't performed particularly well, they were not going to interfere with her discretion. Judge's discretion with regard to sentencing is something that's very valued. Um, and so they were not going to change it. Now, what's important to understand is that this decision by the California uh, Court of Appeals comes down exactly one week before the um, sentencing in the Rodney, uh, the guilty, the non-guilty version of uh, verdict in the Rodney King case. So there's this outcry in the community that's going on about Latasha's case that's been reignited one week before. And then people say, well, let's see what's going to happen with Rodney King and whether or not um, they are going to see something that looks like justice uh, with Rodney King. Of course, they do not, and as far as the Black community is concerned. So these two cases become very linked um, in the, um, uh, in the political, politicized imagination uh, of African-Americans and our sense of whether or not African-Americans can receive justice um, in the quote unquote criminal justice system. So the book really you know, covers this kind of landscape, um, looking at the individual lives of the three main people, the three main females. And what I try to do is look deeply into um, their ethnic or racial past to see how these three females really inter 
face with one another around this um, particular case. So when I look at, you know, for example, um, Latasha's past, and I use, again, um, census records, ancestry.com, et cetera, um, to look at, they you know, come up as enslaved people in Alabama and in Mississippi and in North Carolina. Um, you know, if you look at the criminal justice system from that point of view, you will see the relationship of the criminal justice systems to enslaved people and enslaved women, as well as enslaved men, uh, you will see that it has not been a, uh, a system that has treated um, women as um, potential victims, but have treated them instead as uh, violators of crime. Okay. It's also from the 1665 Barbadian Slave Code, um, the first um, slave code in the British um, Americas um, or the British New World. We see that um, African descended people are not treated as equals. They are indeed uh, thought of as savage or barbaric and therefore don't deserve a trial by jury. Um, and also in that particular slave code that we see repeated over and over again, whether you look at South Carolina, Virginia, um, all of the colonies and then the states that had black slavery, that African descended people, um, if they are in some kind of um, physical conflict with a white person and they are killed, then that person, that non-black person is not to be held accountable um, for that. That is a lingering stain on the criminal justice system that actually comes from the colonial period and it's folded into, um, it's folded into law um, prior to the American Civil War and the 14th Amendment, et cetera. Um, but that is, that sense of African Americans should not be considered equal before the law really starts with um, the British Empire um, in the Americas, in Barbados in the 1660s, as soon as it's in the Jamaican Slave Code, as soon as in the Virginia Slave Code, as soon as in the South Carolina Slave Code, etc. All right. So, and then as we get, of course, into um, this is a, the the hanging of the lynching of Laura Nelson um, on one of the, the the postcards of lynchings that we have left over from the Jim Crow period. Um, we also see um, that the way in which Black women are treated. This is a kind of symbol of the way in which Black women are treated um, in the criminal justice system. This young woman uh, was found guilty of a crime of killing someone um, that there was very little evidence that she had killed. Indeed, she's hanged in this dress, but this dress is given to her by her father, okay? The dress is given to her by her father, but the dress belonged to uh, a disabled white female who was found killed, all right? All it was that she had the dress on, she was found guilty by um, a lynch mob, and she was hanged um, in the dress. And this is actually in the state where Latasha's family lived um, during this time period. So I kind of trace, you know, um, the family's backgrounds um, and look the way at the way in which they are treated in the law, and also the way in which they interface with other racialized groups, or whether they're white or or um, Asian American or Latinx or um, as uh, or ethnic cultural groups like Jewish people as, as Judge Carlin is um, within the book too. So, uh, and then we get to Mrs. Du. And so one of the things I want my audience to understand is that it's not just African-Americans who have been criminalized in the past. And so um, if we look at the three women, if we look at um, Latasha and then we look at Mrs. Du and then we look at Judge Carlin, we will see that their racial ethnic groups also have been criminalized in the past, but they have been able to, as quote unquote, uh, model minorities move outside largely of that criminalization and that discriminatory um, 
uh, this way of looking at them in discriminatory um, fashion. So this is at the end of the 19th century, of course, where we have the nadir of race relations really, but we also have a lot of immigrants um, coming in and we have the um, Asian Exclusion Act, for example, that excludes, excludes people of, um, of, of from China and from Japan and from any uh, Korea, which is then um, controlled by um, Japan. And so, um, um, so we see this kind of lawlessness that also people associate with um, um, Asian immigrants, all right? Um, uh, at the end of the 19th century, this would be the same time period in which Laura Nelson was hanged, for example, and this notion of, you know, Black people being um, criminally driven also is shared by, um, by, by people of, um, of Asian um, ancestry. Uh, shared in terms of their racialization. And, it's, and, and also we just saw this resurgence of um, the ways in which Asian um, derived people were thought of as being dirty and diseased and all that also at the end of the 19th century. And even though Asian Americans are considered, um, you know, model minorities, this idea, this notion, this discriminatory racist um, sense of them just re with COVID, you know, just reemerged with this, and, and Asian Americans were victimized as a result of this, were actually beaten and roughed up and, you know, cursed out and diminished uh, because this, this lingering sense of them being um, purveyors of disease came right back up again, all right? Uh, with COVID, as we, you know, even our president calls it the China virus, the China flu, or, or, or et cetera. Okay. So, but they're not the only persons. So when I'm looking at Judge Carlin, and she comes from a family, I was able to trace her family back to or they, when they came to the United States um, at, the, at the very end of the 19th century um, from Russia via England um, to Boston. But there was a huge, uh, you know, a large, large influx of Jewish immigrants uh, from Eastern Europe during this time period. And with, as with Asian immigrants at the time, uh, they are discriminated against and they're racialized. And so one of the things I talk about in the book is how this group also is racialized and, um, and eventually becomes a quote unquote model minority, uh, particularly at the end of the uh, World War II. But before that, we're very much uh, thought of as, as you can see in this cartoon, this um, uh, by Frank Beard cartoon at the end of the 20th, at the at the turn of the 20th century, thought of as being diseased and impoverished. And, and look at the skin tone. The skin tone also is darkened. So at the end of the 19th century, what I talk about in the book is how there are all these people who are lumped together with African Americans. And then in the 20th century, there begins to be some space that is, um, that's in terms of our uh, racialized hierarchy, um, social hierarchy, cultural hierarchies, et cetera, that's, um, that's placed in there between African Americans and these other groups of people. Now I talk about, um, you know, uh, Korean Amer Asian Americans and Jewish Americans because they're the other two groups that are represented by these three women. Represented, loosely saying, I mean, that's their ancestry. They don't represent, um, just as Latasha doesn't represent all black people, certainly Judge Collin doesn't represent all Jewish people and Sun Ja Du doesn't represent all Korean or Asian people, but that is their ancestry, okay? And that's their own personal histories that is brought to bear um, uh, in this particular case. All right, so, and then I just like to, you know, um, I often do this in my class, but I also do so in the book is to look at this particular cartoon in which we have tended, we've, uh, we've tended as, as a nation to racialize people. Um, the Papists were of course the Irish and the Italians, all right, and you know, not wanted in the country. Then the Chinese immigrants not wanted in the country, and then the Jewish immigrants not wanted in the country. And now, um, uh, you know, 
more re recently, of course, we have people from Central America uh, not wanted in the, uh, in the country. Uh, and it's very um, interesting because you can see, I, I like, just like to um, bring this up. We must erect a wall of brass around the country for the exclusion of Catholics. Um, and this is actually, uh, is quoted from John Jay, who was the first chief justice of the Supreme Court. So it's not, uh, the, the, the same issues that we see in our society today are not brand new issues. These are issues that we have seen, you know, over time and that, that play themselves out in our society today and certainly played out in this particular case. All right, so uh, one of the other things I talked about, I'm, I'm looking at my time, but one of the other things I talk about when I when I talk about um, Judge Carlin is that she was, it was not only, um, so it wasn't just we were looking at um, the ways in which Latasha was diminished in um, the court or the way that Mrs. Du uh, was taken up as a kind of victim herself, uh, not uh, the person who pulled the gun, but the person who was initially beaten. Because if you read the judge's um, decision about the sentencing, she sees Mrs. Du as the victim, not Latasha as the victim. And she said, even says in her sentencing that if Latasha had lived and she was in her court, she probably would be sentencing her for assault on a shopkeeper and not the other way around. Uh, at any rate, one of the things that happened around um, Mrs. Uh, George, uh, um, Judge Carlin's decision was a, an attempt to diminish her as a female judge, okay, as a female. All right, so it wasn't just kind of um, racist and um, cultural um, discriminatory responses to this case, but also very sexist uh, responses too. And because she was fairly young, 41 at the time, as far as I'm concerned now, she was very young, but at any rate, um, but she also was petite uh, and she had curly blonde hair, all right? So she was dubbed the Barbie judge. Okay. And so her competence was undermined, um, her sense of her ability to judge this case, to sentence, was placed within the context of the dumb blonde. And this was a woman who her entire life had been intellectually gifted and was very clear. She had been skipped grades when she was young. You know, um, she um, had uh, done really well in law school. She'd done really well um, when she worked um, in the Justice Department, et cetera. And so now all of a sudden she's dumb. Okay, she's a dumb curly haired blonde um, person. And so um, she was called the Barbie uh, judge. So there's a lot going on um, in terms of this particular um, case and the women who are involved in it. Um, so, but it really comes down to a certain sense of questioning justice, which is what we see today happening as well. Whether or not certain groups of people can, um, will get justice within our society. So of course the chant, no justice, no peace. Um, actually that chant, we associated with Rodney King, but it actually was first used with Latasha Harlins. Okay. And so um, it was simply, you know, because, um, because the case went to trial first and all of that. Um, so we have this say no justice, no peace associated with this case um, as well. All right. So again, I just want to remind you of what the sentencing looked like, why people found it um, so, so offensive. And I want to end because we're going to have some Q&A. I want to end my presentation by just reading a really small part um, of a chapter in the book that I think really encapsulated the kind of outrage uh, that people had about this. And um, so this section of the book, and it's just a, a page, this is a slap in the face of every African-American um, citizen, and that's a quote. So the black community activists rendered most vocal opposition to Carlin's sentencing decisions, but were joined by an array of other political and social leaders. Even some in the Korean community spoke against it. Some justice, K.W. Lee, the editor of the English version of the Korea Times wrote, insisting that he spoke for many other Korean and Korean American residents. No one day, not one day in jail for taking a human life. 
Um, in stark contrast to, and I want to move forward, we just move forward to this picture. Um, he says, so in stark contrast to her fellow Korean immigrant, Brendan Sheen, who had been given 30 days in county jail for abusing his dog. And you see in this picture, this is a name of, a, this is a Cocker Spaniel named Baby. And this was an infamous case that also was in the courts in Los Angeles at the time. Now, Lee's referral to the case of a 26-year-old Brendan Sheen, who was an um, immigrant, uh, also a Korean immigrant, who had been convicted of physically abusing his eight-month-old Cocker Spaniel named Baby. Baby, um, the idea that a Korean immigrant was sentenced to a month in jail for hurting a dog, but that another Korean immigrant, Soon Ja Du, did not receive any prison time for the death of a 15-year-old African-American girl was proof, many said, that Los Angeles' criminal justice system was completely biased against African-Americans, including African-American women and children. And it was not just that baby was protected through the justice system. Well-wishers poured their hearts out in newspapers with cars and with donations to baby that totaled well over $10,000. The black community was incensed. So Herschel Hunt of Placenta, like many others could not get past the image of a dog's life seemed more valued and protected in the justice system than a black girl's life. Quote, I have been trying to understand the judge's decision to give Sun Ja Du probation in the murder trial of a black teenager, Latasha Harlins. He wrote, it's a letter to the LA um, Sentinel, which is the black newspaper in town. Quote, I have followed the trial very carefully over the last several weeks. I've also followed a trial in Orange County where a white teenager accidentally shot and killed another white teenager at a senior prom party. In that case, the judge handed down the maximum sentence of 17 years in prison. With these two cases as a background, another case, a Korean was sentenced to 30 days in prison for kicking his dog. Suddenly everything was very clear to me. In my mind, at this moment, a black person's life is not worth as much as a dog. A black woman who lived in Los Angeles was equally poignant in her letter to the Los Angeles Times. There she wrote of weeping when she heard this sentence and fearing for the lives of her children. Quote, until now, I did not think it was possible to be killed twice, she added. However, that is just what happened to 15-year-old Latasha Harlins at the hands of our justice system. A woman who was convicted of voluntary manslaughter uh, was given probation, community service, and a $500 fine. This is a slap in the face of every African-American citizen. Judge George Collin has just told us that it was open season on our children, in the quote. And so I'll stop there and I'll take some questions and answers. Oh, and hopefully I'll answer them. <laughs> I'll be able to, <laughs> great. <laughs> Thanks so much, Brenda. That that was just amazing, and and um, there were some some questions about the relevance um, of your materials from 1991 to today. But you you drew out that relevance <laughs> throughout your talk. So so thank you very much. We had we had people uh, listening from um, Iowa, California, various places in New York, all over North Carolina. So. So you've got quite a quite a following, um, and 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 oh, I've got some re really interesting questions. Um, let me let me start there. There are one or two that um, are, are specific to the to the time that you're talking about of of this uh, of this uh, these events. Um, one one listener asks, how many high schools were there in Los Angeles at the time, and were the students bust? So was there a, a, what was the sort of was there a kind of a segregation in LA at the time? You know that would have led to these kinds of tensions. Well, I can't tell you how many high schools uh, how many high schools were in Los Angeles at the time, but students were bused, and Latasha was bused to Westchester High School, which is a high school that she went to. Yes, students certainly were bused, uh, but black um, the Korea Town is very close to the black community at any rate, which is another reason why it was you know it was close proximity. So in terms of getting there um, during the LA riots, it wasn't very difficult to do so. So um, African American and Korean immigrant. Um, children would have gone to pretty much the same high schools unless the Korean Americans who arrived were in the middle class and then they would have lived 
you know, in the Valley and other places um, as well outside of Koreatown. But Koreatown uh, itself had a, a fairly substantial um, African-American community as well as a Latinx community. Um, and so they would have been in the same high schools um, together. And the instances that I, incidences that I, I speak about, um, actually, um, of course, they're in high school together and it, it, it happened in both high schools where people I'm sure were bust and, and not bust. Interesting, so there was a kind of mixing. Has that changed in, in Los Angeles, do you think, over the last um, two decades? Uh, so well, sort of um, that had, well, there are, uh, most people who live in Koreatown now actually are either Black or Latinx. Um, there are very few um, Korea, I mean, not very few, but I think the, they're not the majority in Koreatown because Koreatown really was a place of transition. It was a place where, you know, people um, came um, and became sort of um, acclimated um, to living outside of South Korea. And so, you know, with uh, the languages of was spoken there, of course, the shops that are there um, would address their needs for, in terms of food and clothing. Um, the churches that were there, of course, also address their um, spiritual needs. And so, but many people, the Jews, for example, and the people who came in the 1970s, for the most part, moved have moved out of the, uh, out of that community and moved into, you know, other kinds of communities and, and spaced themselves out in, in Los Angeles. Right. Yeah. Great. Uh, so it's sort of um, still in, in the in the period of of, of these events. Uh, one listener asks whether local uh, civil rights organizations. Uh, you 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 quoted from some newspaper uh, letters to the newspapers and so on. But did local civil rights organizations get involved um, in this particular case? They were very much involved in this particular case. The Urban League, the NAACP, uh, were involved. There was um, the um, Brotherhood Crusade, which is Danny Bakewell's organization, the Mothers in Action. Um, also, there was a Latasha Holland's Justice Committee that was founded by um, Latasha's aunt, the, the picture that you saw um, that I had on screen of Latasha standing beside a, a, an older Black woman that was her aunt. So they were very much involved. Also, um, Jesse Jackson was involved. Um, uh, Maxine Waters was very much involved in the case um, and, and elected officials, not Tom Bradley. Tom Bradley actually um, stayed away from the case and it was very, very um, undermining uh, for his relationship with the African American community. And in fact, Sun Jia Ju's um, uh, attorneys, one was uh, European American, one was African American. And the African American attorney was a very good friend of Tom Bradley's. And it was rumored that Tom Bradley had asked him um, to take this particular case and so um, and, and to try to see it through. And so he did not get involved and he was called out by the family. He was called out by, um, you know, Danny Bakewell and other people from the community for, for really not um, allowing himself to become involved in it. Amazing, that's, 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 a, that's a really fascinating uh, perspective to see. Uh, another listener asks um, the, a really uh, fascinating question about the importance of video uh, in the Harlan's case and then juxtaposes it to the Rodney King and then of course to the, um, to the uh, George Floyd uh, uh, murder uh, now. Uh, so do you have some ideas about that kind of the use of video and images and stuff in, in recording in, in this case? Oh, most definitely. I mean, first, the, first of all, I, I just want to say that a lot of people have done research on this and, and can tell you precisely what the clear answer to uh, it, it, it is. But we do live in a visual culture. And um, we were even living in a visual culture at that time, even though the, the, Rodney, the Rodney King video was was one of the first real instances of people seeing um, this kind of thing happening and responding to it. But we'd been living in a visual culture really since, since the Vietnam War, if not even before then, you know, looking at World War II, you know, footage and all that kind of stuff and some from World War I as well. So we lived in a very visual, um, you know, um, culture. And so seeing actually a person losing their life or about to lose their life really had impact um, um, on people. And in the case of Latasha, because she is clearly turned around when the gun goes off, 
that was so galling to people. Um, now, the difference between Latasha and, and uh, Rodney King was that uh, many people in the Black community were more incensed about what happened with Latasha than Rodney King. Why? Because she was younger. Okay, because she was a female, uh, because she clearly had the money in her hand and was going to purchase the juice, was not stealing it, um, became, because her mother um, had been killed earlier. And so she was literally a motherless child. Um, also because um, she had not, Rodney King was older. He was an ex-felon. He was um, driving under the influence when he was stopped, you know, so there was, but there was no criminal intent that could be hung on to, uh, to Latasha. And so, you know, as a, as a, a person who was a, uh, owns a really famous bookstore in South Los Angeles told me when I was doing research, it was like, I, he said, I was more upset about Latasha than I was about Rodney King because she hadn't done anything wrong. You know, and of course, it wasn't right that Rodney King was treated this way. You know, I mean, he was beaten uh, unrecognizably, really. His daughter saw him on television the next day and didn't even recognize that it was her father until his name came up. And so, um, but oftentimes we see people, as in the case of um, Michael, um, Michael Brown, for example, try to criminalize the victim. And there was every attempt to criminalize Latasha, but with the black community and other people looking at it, it just couldn't happen. She because was not guilty, you know. And, we had, because we had the video. Yeah. And they had the video and in the imagination of the judge, uh, she was indeed, um, and, and in her sentencing statement, she says that she's actually the, the perpetrator, she's, you know, and so, um, but also we do know too that this video is linked directly with um, the Rodney King beating video during the time of the LA riots or insurrection. And so you, you have it played over and over and over. And there's a lot of discussion about this video and the burning of Koreatown. So people link the two together right then in national news um, to, to show that. Right. We have, we have a question then that's the, that, that probably speaks to this a little bit. Did, did Do ever give any interviews um, then to journalists at any point? Do would this? not give interviews to journalists. She wanted to, but her daughter and her husband and her son did not allow her to do so. So they all gave interviews. The only testimony we have from her is the, um, we have the summary notes of the uh, Patricia Dyer who, Dreyer, who was the probation officer. And we also have her testimony um, in court. We have those two things to go on in terms of looking at um, her feelings about what had happened during the time. Um, but one of the things we do know just from looking at the court transcript is that she would not accept responsibility for it. She just said, you know, she was hit. Her, you know, she didn't know what happened afterwards. The other thing that happened too is that um, she was found to be faking illness when she first went to the, um, she was first arrested and taken to the hospital for treatment. And people would say that she would faint, fainting, but when the nurses would go out, then if they looked back in, then she was walking around and, you know, and all that kind of stuff too. But she, you know, she is a sympathetic figure um, for those people who, want to see her in that way because of her age, because um, her size, because um, she had been beaten by her husband before the police arrived. That's on the videotape too, you know? So, um, you know, people who wanted to find a way to exonerate her, you know, would, would go to those particular instances too. But they really tried to, one of the interesting things is that they really tried to masculinize um, uh, Latasha, they talk about uh, how she was built like a boy and about how she was muscular and about how she hit like a boy, and she hit like a man. And Mrs. Du talked about how she was dressed like, uh, you know, a gang member with her UCLA Bruins cap on, you know, um, and, and all of that. So um, they really do try to make her out to be a gang member. And we know she was not a gang member. All right. Uh, we just we just have a, a few more minutes, and we have actually quite a, quite a number of questions. So thanks to all everyone who's who's listening for these wonderful questions. Um, the the most pressing one, perhaps, to uh, to to uh, channel to you is what are you working on now? One of our listeners wants to know. <laughs> 
Well, um, I typically don't work on the late 20th century. All right. I typically work in the 17th and the 18th and the 19th centuries. So I'm finishing up a book on slave family, uh, black slave family uh, in the America, in North America from 1600 to um, 1860. And that should be out in the next year or so. I'm beginning to work also on a book on a black woman um, who was um, an abolitionist um, in the 19th century. And so those are things that I'm, I'm working on right now. I've been doing some art pieces um, with um, an artist in Los Angeles. We just, a five piece um, installation project. And um, that's, that looks at black women's lives across five periods of, of history in terms of the chronology. So we're putting together our second iteration. Our first iteration of it was the Jim Crow. It did really well. It showed in Paris and Spain and um, in the United States. It's getting ready to be mounted again in a museum in the United States. Um, and then um, the second piece will be on middle passage and slavery um, of, of black women. So those are the kinds of things that I'm working on uh, now. and. Uh, um, not the 20th century. I get called on a lot because of this book to talk about, you know, racial conflict in the 20th century and in the 21st century. It's very interesting to me. Um, but I had to shift gears completely um, from what I studied in graduate school. And my first book was about to, to write this. And my third book is about to write this book, you know. Um, and so um, I have some plans to co-write a book about Black people in California, um, but again, it's going to start in the early period and go through the 20th century, but um, those are the things I'm working on now. Well, I already knew this, but, but now our listeners can, can, can see that you're a woman of many talents, uh, moves across, across the centuries and, and covers, <laughs> and also you, you've given us hope for, for your um, future, these future books and art, uh, art uh, installations that you're working on. I can't thank you enough, Brenda, for your presentation. It's wonderful. And thanks to everyone also who joined us tonight for this event. Uh, this event has been recorded and will be available on the National Humanities Center YouTube channel. And I encourage you to click uh, right now on the follow button and the notify bell in the bottom corner below this video to be notified of future discussions like this one and other videos uh, coming from the National Humanities Center that you might be interested in. I, I do hope also that you'll come back uh, next Wednesday evening when we'll be joined by Martin Summers from Boston College, who will be discussing his book, Madness in the City of Magnificent Intentions. Good uh, evening to everyone. Thank you again so much, Brenda Stevenson from UCLA. Thank you. And good night to everyone. Good night.